I'm John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor Show. Thaddeus McCotter, my colleague, WJR, the great voice of the Great Lakes. Good evening to you, Thaddeus. And it was an exciting day on Wall Street, but then again, the world markets were roiled on Sunday night as well, coming into tomorrow. And what we have now is expecting that the turmoil will continue all week. Asia's opening within moments or hours, whatever it is that Nikkei opens, and that's the big market in Asia, the Japanese market. However, the attention is on China because of the underlying mystery of what are the Chinese numbers, what is to believe when we hear statements out of the central bank, the PBOC, I'm told to call it, in Beijing. Joining me in studio is John Fund of the National Review Online, and we welcome our colleague, Gordon Chang, Forbes.com contributor. Gordon, I begin with the story of Japan because Prime Minister Abe was in the news in these last hours rejecting an invitation to Beijing to participate in the Victory Over Japan parade, the victory that the Communist Party had nothing to do with. And in any event, I mentioned that the tensions in Asia are outside of the markets, but right now the Japanese market is being hurt. All the markets in Asia are troubled. They're emerging market uh, are emerging markets and they're hurt by the lack of demand from China. There's also competitive devaluation. There's a note tonight about the, Chin- the Chinese currency continuing to decline. Is this a lack of confidence in Beijing? Good evening to you, Gordon. Good evening, John. Y- yes, I think it is certainly a, a lack of confidence. Uh, and this has been uh, a ex- situation that's existed now really since the beginning of July. And also, Chinese technocrats, who are supposedly 10 feet tall, have lost a lot of credibility, not just in the West, but also in China itself. And that's why all of these statements meant to buck up the market are actually having the opposite effect. You know, as we pointed out, Shanghai Composite yesterday fell 8.5%. That follows the fall on Friday of 4.3%, and Thursday it fell 3.4%. So you know, what we're having now is the beginning of a rout. And today, we're going to have to see what China does to protect the market. I'm not so sure that they know what to do. That is. Hey, Gordon, what is going to be the impact on the average Chinese citizen of this? I actually think that China is headed towards a 1930s-style crash. Um, I could very well be wrong. Um, but uh, what we see right now is the Chinese economy falling precipitously. Beijing does not have the ability to change the direction. The only thing that they can do in China right now is slow the reckoning. And therefore, um, I think that there is going to be a terrible uh, adjustment. It's going to occur soon, largely because Chinese leaders now cannot prevent it. Mr. Fund. Gordon, at the core of China's recent expansion has been this curious mixture of political central control and freeing up of markets. They call it market Leninism. But what I always was worried about was the Chinese statistics weren't always reliable and very opaque, fragmentary. Are we now seeing perhaps the curtain being drawn a little bit and that the Chinese economy had weaknesses that were not obvious in the statistics they would release to us? I think that's absolutely right, John. Um, You know, in New York now, people are not talking about the 7.0% growth that the National Bureau of Statistics claims for each of the first two quarters of this year. You know, there's general consensus now that it's 5 or 6% growth. Now, I think that that still is a misperception because, you know, people in China itself are talking about 2.2%. And you've got some underlying statistics that really indicate to a very low single-digit growth. Uh, there's starting to be much more discussion about this around the world, and, and I think that we are going to end up in a month or two with the idea, generally shared uh, in financial capitals around the world, that China is at very low single-digit growth. The competitive devaluation we talked of last week, Gordon, is that going to continue? Can the Chinese, can the central bank buoy the, uh, the, the, the Chinese currency? Well, I I think that there probably will be devaluations uh, around China's periphery, um, largely because it's going to be economically necessary for countries to do so. So, you know, as we've discussed before, in Vietnam, you've had two formal devaluations of the dong. um, And in general, we have seen the South Korean won fall, um, largely in response to what's going on in China. This has got to continue because in China itself, the market is very, very weak. The economy is very weak. 
and, and that has had an effect on economies that are very closely tied to China's, especially Australia, Taiwan, South Korea, Vietnam, and to a lesser extent, Indonesia and Malaysia. Mr. McCotter. Uh, Gordon, what does the United States Federal Reserve make of the devaluation of the Chinese currency? Well, I think that, you know, in the, the July minutes of the Federal Open Market Committee, there were a number of comments from participants about problems in China, and many people outside of the Fed have interpreted this as essentially uh, the Fed deferring the I- increase in interest rates thought to be, you know, originally thought to be in September. Now people are saying it's going to be perhaps next year. So you know, China's problems are affecting what we should be doing in the U.S., which is increasing interest rates. We need to get beyond zero for a number of reasons. But nonetheless, um, the problems in China are convincing, I think, a number of people that there will be a deferral of this hike in interest rates. Mr. Fund. Gordon, assuming the Fed continues, what will it be, seven years of almost zero interest rates? Yes, seven Um, years. At some point, the jig is up, the bubble bursts, the string runs out, whatever metaphor you want to use. Uh, China, I think by affecting central bank policy in other countries and continuing to encourage the Europeans, for example, to do quantitative easing, this is making the world more danger the world economy more dangerous and more prone to a sudden collapse, isn't it? Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more, um, because I think that outside China, we should see central banks doing the opposite. Um, but as you point out, um, because of the China factor, we are going to see some pretty bad decisions in Brussels and probably in Washington as well. Um, the problem is that right now, you know, the China stain is looms very large in people's imagination, and it looms large in the imagination of central bankers. So, uh, as I said, I, I think you're absolutely right about that point. Gordon, anecdotes of Chinese, mainland Chinese, calling London, looking to invest in commercial buildings, looking to throw large sums of money to convert buildings in the city or in the West End. That's consistent with the reporting you've had over this last year of capital flight. This turmoil now, all, all markets go up and down. Does this change the, the acceleration or the direction of the capital flight? Well, oh, clearly, John, um, it's accelerating things as we see in a spike in uh, UN interest rates right now uh, today in China. And that's largely because money is flowing out of the country, and so therefore the currency, uh, you know, they need to defend the renminbi. Um, this is going to be a big story because at the end of the day, you know, you can listen to what central bankers say, but it's what the people of a country do with their money. And clearly they're taking it out at a much faster pace this last week than before. And there are capital controls. Do they work, Gordon? Uh, they they don't work, John, and that's China's problem. Um The capital controls um, are on paper. They are fearsome when you look at them in the book. But, you know, the Chinese people have figured out how to avoid them. You know, the Chinese are just geniuses in avoiding regulation. Mr. McCotter. Uh, Gordon, John Fund had mentioned that the Chinese are trying to engage in market Leninism. Isn't this devaluation combined with their fear of the continued flight of their own capital to foreign markets an indication that when it comes right down to it, they'd prefer the Marxism to the, <laughs> the Leninism to the marketplace? Yes, and, and especially Xi Jinping, China's ruler, you know, his view of a strong China is essentially a view of going back to 1950s economics, especially with the recreation of um, monopolies and also closing the country down, chasing foreign companies out with discriminatory prosecutions. This is a very serious situation. And by the way, John, uh, Shanghai just opened down 6.41%. Oh, you're full of good news tonight, Mr. Fund. Well, John, the Chinese government has always been worried about civil unrest. They've always had an implicit bargain with the people. We provide the goods. You provide the peace and quiet. Um, to the extent that this wakes up the middle class, especially the um, 30% of Chinese who have investment, some investments in the stock market, do you see this kind of turbulence manifesting itself politically or in terms of civil unrest? 
I, there's going to be. You know, um, a crowd in Shanghai detained the head of a metals exchange and turned him over to the police. Yeah, I, I saw that. It was like a citizen's arrest. The citizen's arrest. We're going to see much more of this, um, largely because, look, the Chinese people, they want more say in their lives. They're just like the rest of us. And, and while they fear a repressive government and while they don't want revolution, they certainly don't want what's going on right now. And if you don't have prosperity, your tolerance level for what's going on politically just decreases dramatically. So this is something the Communist Party fears, and that's why it created this stock market bubble in the first place. This is a serious situation. There could be no People's Republic of China by the end of this year, as our friend Ann Stevenson Yang said on your program, John, two weeks ago. We'll speak more of China when Gordon joins me later in the week. Gordon Chang, Forbes.com contributor. That is McCotter, my colleague, WJR, the great voice of the Great Lakes, and John Fund in studio with me of the National Review Online. I'm John Batchelor. <laughs>